1865, the Civil War was over and ex-Confederates began returning home to a financially devastated state. Texas was in financial ruin, but it had one thing, longhorn cattle, millions of them. For four years during the war, longhorns had roamed the free range and multiplied. Unbranded and unclaimed, they were there for the taking. However, they were almost worthless as low as $2 per head. While Texas was awash with cattle, the eastern states were starving for the taste of beef. At one point, being willing to pay as much as $30 to $35 per head. This led to the creation of the cattle drives. There was basically four cattle trails coming out of South Texas. The earliest was the Shawnee Trail it's the green line on the right. It was started back before the Civil War, running from South Texas through eastern Oklahoma, Indian Territory, into Missouri, branching off to St. Louis, Sedalia, and Kansas City. But by 1854, the Shawnee Trail was almost closed. The railroad had reached out further and so had civilization. Farmers were beginning to turn around cattle drives. Longhorns were carrying ticks that they were immune to, but the farm cattle wasn't. With pressure from the homesteaders, the Missouri legislature had outlawed Texas longhorns in the state, basically closing the Shawnee Trail for good. It'll be 1866, one year after the war, when ranchers Charles Goodnight and Oliver Loving established the Goodnight Loving Trail, leaving Texas and traveling west some 75 miles to the Pecos River in order to skirt around most of the Comanche Territory, and then north along the Pecos to Fort Sumner, New Mexico, in order to sell beef to the Army. The trail will later extend to Denver and then on to Cheyenne, Wyoming. Also in 1866, a man by the name of Jesse Chisholm created the Chisholm Trail. The ranchers would gather up longhorns all the way from the Rio Grande in Brownville and travel to Wichita, Abilene, and Ellsworth, Kansas, where the railhead had reached. By 1871, the Chisholm Trail began slowing down because homesteaders was flooding into eastern Kansas and began fencing off trails used by cattle drives. By 1872, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad had reached as far west as Dodge City, Kansas. For the next two years, the railhead at Dodge will ship some 850,000 buffalo hides back east. They also ship thousands of pounds of buffalo bones to make fertilizer out of. Now, by 1874, the buffalo was gone and so was the business that kept Dodge City alive. Also in 1874, the military had placed the Comanche and Kiowa on reservations following the Red River War, opening the way for cattle drovers like Captain John T. Lytle to open up a new trail from Texas through western Oklahoma to Dodge City, Kansas. That same year, Captain Lytle had drove some 3,500 head up what will become the Great Western Cattle Trail, sometimes called the Dodge City Trail. Within five years, the Great Western Trail will become the most used cattle trail in history, as the others were shut down from a growing population and cattle fencing. The Great Western Trail will continue until around the late 1880s, in the last stages, it will continue through Dodge to Ogallala, Nebraska. Over a period of 10 years, millions of head of beef and one million horses will be driven up the trail. The Texas needed to get their cattle to market, so getting them to the railheads when they could be shipped back east was their only way. To start a cattle drive, each rancher would drive their head to a starting point, 
Each rancher had their own brand on their cattle to separate them from others. Then another brand would be placed on all the cattle to show that they belonged to this particular cattle drive. The most important decision made by ranchers was who will they hire to be the trail boss. The man responsible for seeing that their herd gets to the railhead with as little loss as possible. He would document each rancher's brand and the number of cows that he owned. The trail boss had complete authority. What he said went, no exceptions. He was sometimes paid as much as $125 per month, depending on the size of the herd. He would usually set the direction each day that the herd was to travel. The next highest paid member of the drive was the cook, sometimes making as much as $60 per month. The cook had strict rules around the chuck wagon. He was last to go to bed and first to rise. After breakfast, he would drive the wagon ahead of the herd and prepare the meals. Sometimes the cook would have a helper, usually a youngster that they call Little Mary. Now this is a little Mary whose name has been lost to the ages. His job was to fetch water and firewood for the cook. And on longer drives, he might even drive a wagon of supplies. Little Mary would also pick up stray calves in his wagon. Notice the little calf in the middle of the wagon between the bed rolls in the front and the saddle in the back. During the earlier drives, they would either kill calves for food to make stew or simply leave them behind. But they soon learned they brought too high of a price to eat or to leave. Now the next hired was the point men. In large herds, there might be two point riders. They were usually the most experienced men on the drive. The point man rides up front so that he can point the cattle and keep them going in the right direction. They had the best jobs of all the drovers. The swing riders worked in pairs, one on one side of the herd and one on the other. They ride closely on each side of the herd about a third way back from the point riders. Everyone was responsible to gather in strays. About two-thirds of the way back on the herd is the flank riders. Their job was to keep the cattle bunched together as much as possible. At the back of the herd is the drag riders. Their job was to keep the herd moving and pushing the slower animals forward. Theirs was the worst job on the drive from all the dust that the herd stirred up. Usually the most inexperienced drovers work the drag. The drovers were paid around $35 per month. Drives usually begin in the spring after roundup when grass is readily available and before cold weather set in. Usually a crew consisted of 8 to 14 men. Each drover would pick his own horses from the remuda that he alone will ride during the drive. Each man would have from three to sometimes as high as 10 remounts each. They would change horses sometimes as much as six times a day. Their horses were continuously moving, chasing breakaway steers and keeping the herd moving forward. The drovers never was allowed to ride their own horses. The horses belonged to the drive. That way the drovers could not quit the drive and ride off on a horse that didn't belong to them. They hung horse thieves. The remuda would sometimes have 50 to 100 horses. Usually the wrangler who took care of the horses was a young drover whose job it was to see that they were fed and doctored when needed. The wrangler was paid around $25 per month, and he had sometimes helped the cook when needed. The remuda would travel behind the cook's wagon or where it was convenient for the drovers to change mounts. Notice how close the remuda is to the chuck wagon in this picture. Now, this is a map, basically, of the Great Western Cattle Trail. 
Drives would form as far south as Brownville, San Antonio, Carryville, Mason, Lampasas, and San Angelo. The trail left Texas and crossed into Indian Territory, now western Oklahoma, to Dodge City, Kansas. Later, it will extend to Ogallala, Nebraska. Now, other trails later will travel as far north as Wyoming and Montana, supplying horses and cattle to remote ranches. A modern-day Highway 283 loosely follows the cattle trail through Texas, Oklahoma, and into Kansas. The first obstacle facing the drive was crossing the Red River from Texas into Oklahoma at Doan's Crossing. This is Doan's store where the drovers could buy goods and chuck wagons could resupply for the trail ahead across Indian Territory. This is the only building still standing at Doan's Crossing. The river crossing was only a half a mile from the store. Now this is modern day riders crossing the Red River. In one year, five drovers lost their lives crossing here. The trail from Texas to Dodge was approximately 600 miles. Cattle could travel as much as 10 to 15 miles per day. Trail bosses soon learned the faster you push the cattle, the more weight they lost, and the less money they would bring. Some drivers would arrive in Dodge after two months on the trail, if everything went perfect, which it seldom did. Sometimes a herd would string out as far as two miles, depending on its size. Drovers had three meals a day with lots of coffee. They ate beans and stew and biscuits. They had sometimes stopped their herd at noon and let the cattle graze while the drovers ate their noon meal. After around 14 hours in the saddle and after settling the herd down at night, they would gather around the chuck wagon for the final meal of the day. The chuck wagon carried in the back rolled up bed rolls for the cowboys as you can see in this picture. They usually slip in a circle around the campfire. Now it's time to ride night herd. Each drover would have to pull a two-hour shift, two at a time. One would ride clockwise around a herd, while the other would ride counterclockwise. They would often sing quietly to the cattle to help keep them calm. Nighttime was the most dangerous time for drovers. Stampedes were more likely at night. During bad weather, everybody slept ready to go at a moment's notice. Lightning caused more stampedes than any other thing. But any noise could do the trick. Even after the Plains Indians were no longer a threat, sometimes a small group of hungry Indians would stop the herd and demand a few head. It was up to the trail boss to negotiate a deal keeping in mind that if they were dissatisfied, they could easily sneak in at night and stampede their herd, causing more loss than the Indians were asking for to start with. Many cowboys were lost trying to stop stampedes. Riding full speed alongside hundreds of longhorns when your horse stumbles could be fatal. The only way to stop a stampede was to get ahead of the lead steers and turn the herd to the right until they begin running in a circle. When the front of the herd runs into the slower moving rear of the herd, they eventually slowed down and stopped. During dry weather, thirsty cows could smell water from a long distance. The danger was that they would start running towards water and run off of steep banks, bunch up in the river and drown. In one of their earlier drives, cattle bunched up in a swollen river where 800 head were lost out of 3,000. Lead steers were very important. Sometimes there'd be just one and sometimes there'd be several. Leaders would come to the front of the herd by themselves, automatically. One such lead steer was Charles Goodnight's Old Blue. Now, Blue was a natural born leader. Goodnight used Old Blue on eight different cattle drives. 
It's been said that Old Blue would not take part in a stampede, that he'd just simply stand aside until it was over, and then he'd take his place at the head of the herd. Good night placed this bell around Old Blue's neck so that the rest of the herd would know where he was at and feel more contented. It's been said that Old Blue would not bed down with the rest of the herd, but would hang around the chuck wagon at night so that they would feed him biscuits and scraps. The cowboys were quite fond of Blue, and after some twenty years, Good Night retired him to green grass at his J.A. Ranch in the Paladura Canyon in Texas. According to drover Nat Love, who was one of the most respected drovers of the Old West, stated in his memoirs that a braver, truer set of men never lived, or a tighter bonds formed them during a cattle drive. They was always ready to share a blanket or rations with anyone less fortunate. Although black cowboys faced the same discrimination while traveling through towns as other blacks, they receive respect and equal treatment on the range and on ranches. Many ex-slaves headed west to join cattle drives. Some 35,000 drovers that pushed cattle up trails for some 12 years or more, from 5,000 to 8,000 of them were black cowboys. Some estimates go as high as one out of every four were black ex-slaves. Now, after crossing the Red River, the next major obstacle was the Canadian River. Here is the trail boss negotiating with the Indians after crossing the Canadian. After the Canadian, the trail boss would ride out looking for streams of water like this one outside of Fargo, Oklahoma, that herds would bed down close to at night, and cowboys would sometimes look for an opportunity to bathe. The last major crossing was the Cimarron River, close to the Oklahoma-Kansas border. By then, the herd was less than a hundred miles from Dodge City, the end of the trail. When the herd reached Dodge, they were placed in holding pens on the east side of town, waiting to be loaded into boxcars to be shipped back east. After selling the herd, the trail boss would then pay the cowboys. With money in their pockets and ready to celebrate, most would first buy new clothes, then shave and wait their turn to take a bath. They might even take a room at the Dodge House where Doc Holliday had an office, or the Great Western Hotel so that they could sleep on a real bed instead of the ground. Next came the gambling and drinking. Dodge had its share of saloons but the Long Branch was the best known. Not all drovers got into gunfights and ended up in jail, but some did. Not all fights were over women. Here's a Dodge City working girl, black eye and all, that got into a fight with another working girl over a cowboy. After a few days rest and recuperation, it was time to saddle up and take the long trail home back to Texas. By 1885, most of the cattle drives were coming to a close, mostly because of the encroachment of Bob Warr.